a little more, or roughly halfway from the center to the visible edge of the disk of the galaxy in the midplane. The galaxy is about 100,000 light years in diameter. So it takes 100,000 years for light to cross the diameter of the Milky Way galaxy. Now, the factors that set the boundaries of the galactic habitable zone are the following. There are fewer elemental building blocks to form Earth-like planets and fewer stars in the outer disk of the Milky Way galaxy. So as you go out from the center of the galaxy out to the edge, first of all, the density of the stars drops. So you're just not going to have very many stars towards the outer edge. But secondly, the abundance of heavy elements goes down. Okay? And you need things like oxygen and iron and magnesium and silicon to build Earth-like planets, terrestrial rocky planets. Okay, so those elements be are becoming rarer towards the outer disk of the galaxy. And as I mentioned before, the threats to complex life are greater in the inner regions of the galaxy. So the most habitable region is uh, an annulus, about halfway out from its nucleus and not including the spiral arms. And so uh, you don't want to be too close to the center of the galaxy because it's too dangerous, but you can't be too far out because then you don't have enough building blocks to build Earth-sized planets. And so it's an annulus at an intermediate range of distances, something like that. <laughs> That's just a cartoon uh, representation of the galactic habitable zone. We still don't know exactly how wide that annulus is. In fact, this is one area of research that, I, that I'm working on, is trying to better define the boundaries of the galactic habitable zone. And I uh, pre also present the circumstellar habitable zone here on the lower left, uh, zoomed out from uh, that uh, yellow spot representing the sun, uh, just to show you that they superficially look similar. They're both annually but for very different reasons. Remember, the circumstellar habitable zone is defined in terms of how much sunlight you get on the surface of a planet. So it d d defines a certain range of distances that you, where you can have liquid water. But the galactic habitable zone is defined by other things. Now, a different question. For scientific discovery, where would you want to be? Well, it turns out you want to be in the galactic habitable zone. We happen to be living in a region of the galaxy that has a very low level of dust. That's important because dust, uh, it, bet dust between stars. There's actually dust in, uh, in space, not just in your bedroom. Uh, but it, if there's a lot of dust, then that tends to block our view of the distant universe. We happen to be living in a very, very clear area between spiral arms. Spiral arms are very dusty. Between the arms, it's not so dusty. But even in our location between the arms, it's less dusty than average. And that gives us particularly clear views of the distant universe. Also, our location right at the midplane, uh, in the middle of the th very thin disk, permits close-up views of diverse types of stars, which is vital for understanding stellar physics and property in properly interpreting observations of distant galaxies. After all, distant galaxies are made up of stars. And if you can't understand stellar physics and how stars produce new elements in their interiors and go through their life cycles, then you can't understand the distant galaxies either. And perhaps most importantly, uh, our location far from the galactic center and combined with the flattened shape of the galaxy permit us a good view of the cosmic background radiation. Uh, why is that important? And what's the cosmic background radiation? The cosmic background radiation is the holy grail of cosmology. It was first discovered in 1964-65 by uh, two uh, engineers named Penzias and Wilson, and uh, they found it by accident. And in fact, some other astronomers were actually going to be looking for it about that same time, but they were beat to the punch uh, discovering it, and they won the Nobel Prize for it. Um, and why is it important? Well, the background radiation, here's a modern picture of it on top in the middle. Uh, produced by the WMAP satellite uh, using data collected over the last few years, is a picture of radiation left over from a much earlier time in the history of the universe, when the universe was much hotter and much denser. Over time, the universe has been expanding, and this radiation has been getting fainter and redder, so-called red-shifted, so that now it's in the microwave and radio part of the spectrum. 
But why is it important? It's important because that was the linchpin. That was the deciding factor between the two main competing cosmological theories of the 20th century. The steady state theory, first of all, which stated or argued that the universe has always been here. It was eternal. And the competing theory, the Big Bang theory, that said that the universe had a beginning. And so it was a time when the universe was much denser, much hotter. And there was a prediction, therefore, that there had to be this leftover radiation from that early time when the universe was much hotter and much denser. And if the Big Bang Theory was right, uh, that would still be around. And so that was discovered in 64 and 65. And, and that was the deciding factor for most astronomers between those two theories. So it was because of that discovery now that astronomers think that the universe had a beginning rather than thinking that it was eternal. And those are two very different theories. I don't think you can get any more different than that. So it's quite monumental in, in its importance. Uh, so these just shows, uh, show the observations of the background radiation over the whole sky uh, in galactic coordinates. So the plane of the galaxy is that horizontal red line that you see there on the top diagrams. And then the middle one is the cleaned image. The reason we can, quote, clean the data and remove the foreground contamination from our galaxy is because we're located far from the center of the galaxy and we lived in a flattened galaxy. If we lived in a galaxy which was much more spherical and or lived closer to the center of our galaxy, the foreground contaminants would have nearly the same distribution as the background radiation. They'd be more spherically distributed in the sky, and so you couldn't separate the two. Remember, this background radiation glow is very faint. Okay, so it's, a, it's a subtle detection. And so you, you need to be able to measure it cleanly uh, over a good portion of the sky. Which leads me to the final example, our special cosmic time. We actually uh, live near the best time to measure the background radiation in the universe. Um, over time, the background radiation is going to continue to get fainter and fainter. And stars will continue to form in the galaxy, and so you have more foreground uh, contamination sources. And in the earlier part of the history of the universe, the star formation was much more intense. Galaxies were much, much more dusty, and so they had much more uh, foreground contamination that would have made it much more difficult to measure the background radiation. We also live in the narrow window of time when we can measure both the Hubble expansion of the universe as well as the acceleration caused by the dark energy. I don't know if you've heard about that second discovery, the dark energy. That was only discovered about 10 years ago. In fact, it was a discovery of the year 1998 or 1997 for science in Science Journal, Science Magazine. Uh, and uh, so the universe is not only expanding, it's actually accelerating. But we live in a special time where we can measure both of these. Okay, they're both of comparable uh, uh, amount. And thirdly, we can still measure the unpolluted abundances of the light element isotopes. I'm sorry to get so technical on you, but there are three legs that support modern cosmology. There's the observation of the dynamics and distribution of galaxies in the universe to measure the expansion and acceleration of the universe. That's the first one. The second is the measurement of the cosmic background radiation, demonstrating that there was a time when the universe was much hotter and denser. And the third is the abundances of the light isotopes, hydrogen in its isotopes, helium in its isotopes, and lithium. These were produced uh, in the earliest moments of the universe. And the amounts of these elements have to be consistent with the other observations that we get uh, for our models. Okay, only a certain amount of helium was produced, only a certain amount of lithium. And it turns out we measure, the amounts that we measure today are consistent uh, with what the models say based on calibrations from other observations. So things are very self-consistent today. So overall, we live near the best time to do cosmology. And I'm not the only person who's noticed, who has noticed this. In fact, our book was published in 2004, but uh, this statement was just published uh, a few months ago, this year, by two very prominent physicists, Lawrence Krauss and Robert Scherer. They wrote, the remarkable co cosmic coincidence that we happen to live at the only time in the history of the universe when the magnitude of the dark energy and dark matter densities are comparable has been a source of great current speculation. But this coincidence endows our current epoch with another special feature, namely that we can actually infer both the existence of the cosmological expansion and the, and the existence of dark energy. Thus, we live in a special time in the evolution of the universe. 
the time at which we can obser observationally verify that we live in a very special time <laughs> in the evolution of the universe. And I just very recently found a paper published in 1987 uh, by George Ellis, of another famous cosmologist, who basically made the same observation, uh, that we're living at about the same, best time in the history of the universe to do cosmology. Now, we're also living during the most habitable time in the history of the universe. Over time, sunlight stars will become more scarce. And all you'll be end ending up with is red dwarfs in the distant future of the universe. And the red dwarfs aren't very habitable. And the abundances of the geologically important radioisotopes will continue to decline. And I've got to explain a little bit about that. Uh, for certain geological processes to continue for